Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by psychologist, personal development coach, and podcast host. She is the host of the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life show, Doreen Downing. Doreen suffered from stage fright and had a problem with public speaking, but she has mastered it now, and she is going to show others how to master it and what the key is to mastering finding your voice. So Doreen, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I feel so welcomed by you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you got thank you for being here. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Hmm. Well, let's see. Live just in Northern California here, and it's rainy and cold, but I carry the sun in my heart. That's kind of the person I am. And it I just feel like it I'm so blessed to be on a show, being able to share my own personal journey and hope that it is inspiring to those who struggle, struggle with speaking up in public. And Curtis, I just have to say one thing. Public is not just a stage, you know, it could be any conversation, you know, with a friend or family or sitting around a table. So that's that's my thrust. It's not so much public speaker, get on a stage. It's be yourself and speak. Well, why don't you just tell everybody how you got started? Because I know you're a psychologist. So kind of go <laughs> through your journey and tell us how you mastered uh, speaking in public and how you why you want to help others. <laughs> that that's a uh, kind of a a question that takes me back to a moment you're saying yes i'm a psychologist that's true <laughs> and here i was a professional hiding the fact that i had stage fright and as long as there was just one person in my office it was easy you know i just sat and listened and you know found the ways in which i could help them and the focus wasn't on me. So I didn't really have to be somebody who was speaking up in public. It was just one person. But one day, a conference organizer asked me to present my research at a psychology conference. And I said, not me. I'm afraid of public speaking. I'm terrified. Don't ask me to get up and speak in front of a group. And that was, I could say that was a moment where I was like, I was exposed. And the conference organizer said, but doctor, isn't fear your business? So what do you think about that, Curtis? Isn't fear your business is what came back at me. And what was I, I was kind of caught. Well, yeah, it's my business, but yeah, I have my own fear. And as long as I don't get invited to speak in public, I'm okay, which is kind of true for most people. You know, they think that they aren't good public speakers. And so they just avoid it. And that's what I did for most of my life is just avoid it, not step up and not step into the spotlight and not step into being the center of attention. And I think that moment where I was confronted, kind of exposed, you might say, and there I was, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to always walk around hiding this uh, stage fright? No. So I took my first class in overcoming my fear. And I can relate so much to people who have had public speaking anxiety, because I, I had it too. And that was the beginning of my journey to face. And that's something I teach people is to be able to turn around and move toward the fear, not away. And every time you move away, meaning, you know, make an excuse, don't show up for the meeting that you're going to be presenting, or somehow 
pretend that you can't do it. Um, it increases the brain, it's part of the brain that says, oh, whew, I got out of it. Phew, I got out of it. And it just makes it harder and harder and harder to face. So my first message to our listeners is you have to be willing or find somebody like me or some other coach or or therapist or healer who's going to help you whew, do what it takes to move toward fear. And this fear of speaking up, I think, is deeper than just learning to learning how to make a speech or learning how to uh, find words. I think that it's a deeper question. Well, what do you think causes public speaking anxiety? Great question. As a psychologist, <laughs> I always am curious and people come to me and they are puzzles. It was like, what happened to you? What happened to you that you got so scared? And I always like to go as deep as the person is willing to open up. I just started working with somebody and that was, that's always what I do. I always say, so let's start early on in life, you know, how you came into this world, who were your siblings? What were your parents like? I like to get the scene. And this person just never, ever thought that being a triplet had anything to do with their current adult situation where they feel like they can't speak up at work. And when he said that he was a part of a three children growing up, his sisters took up all the space in the room. They were... They were people who were more verbal, and he held himself back because they were just better at it, and they took up all the space. So that's one, just only one example of how, as a little kid, he didn't really get a lot of, um, I'm just going to say the word space again, to find his ability to develop being comfortable with all eyes on him, taking up space and speaking, speaking and being heard because his other two siblings were much better at it. So just let them do it, right? Absolutely right. And, and speaking of that and uh, taking up space, um, why do you feel that people get so nervous when they have to speak publicly? Well, I think it's somewhat like what I just said is that they don't realize that what's going on is um, a part of their brain. It's the, you know, we call it the lizard brain or the, uh, the brain that's less developed, the survival brain. The frontal part of our brain is a whole different wiring system. So what's happening is that in the back, that's where the emotion is, the fright. You know, that, that, that in a snap of a finger, uh, will get activated. And so the person is um, being asked to speak up at a meeting or being asked to give a presentation or just asked to uh, say something at the dinner table, and they feel nervous about doing that. And you're asking, why do they feel nervous? I think it's a part of the brain where they were unable at some point in their life to take the room, the space to say, to speak up, and they didn't ever get a chance. There's so many examples. And I think it's a deeper thing than just, oh, it's an explanation that I think goes back to when people first started using their voice as little kids is that they, um, you know, that they didn't get the kind of, yay, you, welcome to the world. I really like what you're saying. And here, tell me more. In fact, m a lot of us were neglected. A lot of us were not um, we were told that, you know, children are to be seen and not heard that I hear that a lot, or there's bullying in school. So why, 
even step up to any kind of speaking if your whole life experience has been about being bullied or marginalized or, you know, pushed away from uh, the the center of attention because somebody else is better at it. Why even risk? So I think what you're, I think what you're hearing me say that when we talk about the origins, I think there are underlying causes and that speaking programs don't go as deep as where I think the underlying cause of public speaking anxiety lies, which is usually in those earlier roots when we start to say, hello world, and then we realize, is the world listening? Is the world welcoming us? Is the world really ready? Do we feel like the world is really saying yes back to us? Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, it it definitely makes perfect sense. What about you? What about you in public speaking? (laughs) Well, It's going to be leading into my next question. I am good, or I'm not going to say good, but I'm okay and I can get through public speaking because I'm a podcast host and a a hip hop artist. So I've been comfortable behind the mic for years. And uh, so I'm good at it, but I'm also an introvert. And I know a lot of people out there are introverts and they might not be good at public speaking. So how can introverts like myself get good at public speaking? Yes, I'm an introvert also. And that goes back to the fact that when I was talking about the roots of anxiety, the underlying roots, which I dive into with people, there's also not just circumstances of life, there's also what we bring into the world, like you and I, introverts. (laughs) And So that what we know is that I would say those introverts, hey, you introverts out there, there's something really special about you. There's really something special about us. Join the club and learn that there are ways in which you can tap into. And it for me, what I teach is a whole different process than those kind of public speaking pro- uh, coaches that help you um, be some like a public speaker. What I work with is helping you find, and that's what my podcast is about, find your voice so that you can feel more comfortable and confident being who you truly are. And this whole idea about finding your voice, it's in there. We all have voices, whether we're introverts or extroverts, we introverts have, I think, an even more, what, kind of a a resonant, a resonant voice where we, I feel, can reach those, those in the world who are more shy and more like you, Curtis. I mean, you're, you're, you're in a model of saying, hey, you can do something that just because you're an introvert, you think you might not be able to, right? Absolutely right. And and you might start off nervous in the beginning, but what I found is once you get into it, that nervousness kind of goes away and you just do what you need to do. Yeah, there's uh, there's the two things about that philosophy, I think, in the world is that get out and do it anyway, feel the fear and do it anyway. A lot of people I work with have tried that. And what they do, especially if they've been, if they have an injury around their voice, uh, they re-injure, you know, it's like re-traumatizing. So what I like to do is have people take baby steps first, (laughs) you know, that they learn a few techniques that I teach. And those techniques are about being more still, learning how to silence those voices in your head, those negative, you can't do it, somebody's going to judge you voices, as well as learning how to physically calm your body down from that being a little too anxious to being deeply more calm and more present in this here and now moment. 
that's what I teach is presence and connection. And what are you connecting to? You're connecting to your essential core. And those of us who are introverts, just like anybody else in this world, have a core that belongs to us. How do we find it? How do we believe it? How do we connect with it? Well, that's that's the inner journey. And that's what what my work is about, is the inner journey to find your voice. It's not about putting on a rah-rah, and it's not about go do it and, and feel it anyway. But like what you just said, Curtis, finding ways in which you can, I think, find your voice in maybe progressive steps. You know, like you just didn't get out in front of a microphone the very first time and be your podcast host. You probably uh, worked up to it so step by step. Yeah, I've definitely worked up to it from doing it by myself to doing it for friends and, and getting in front of, you know, different crowds over the years. And so, yeah, it's definitely something that you need to work into. Let's talk about the the difference between eye contact and eye presence. What, what, what's the difference? Ooh, well, eye contact, if you were talking about, um, that's what most traditional public speaking trainings tell you. Good eye contact, good eye contact, you know, look, look them in the eye. I, because of my work is m- much more based in mindfulness, I prefer to take that pressure off and to say something like, relax the muscles around your eyes, relax your eyes so that you are gazing. And it's a whole different, I mean, somebody who has public speaking anxiety, if we help them learn how to be somebody who gazes as opposed to somebody who has eye contact, and you, I could even feel the difference in the way that I just talked about it. Eye contact has a little more edge to it and a little sharper kind of you have to do it and um, gazing softly at somebody, gazing uh, with a brings up a whole more, it's gentle, it's more gentle. And I think the person who has speaking anxiety, when I instruct them to soften your eyes and gaze gently at the your listener or your audience, one person at a time, that that then helps them relax into being with that one person, making their eyes available. That's one thing I do around the eyes. And the other thing is notice Notice something good about the person that you're speaking with. Notice maybe something like a quality that's inside because so much of the time people, my clients who are, who are afraid to look into the eyes, see judgment, right? They feel like they're going to be judged. Isn't that, isn't that what happens in your experience? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that in working with people who feel like they're going to be judged, I suggest that we uh, move more towards this new approach of, well, just look, uh, you know, gaze softly at somebody. And I know that sounds weird to be in a... (laughs) in a, in a meeting, a high stakes meeting, and I'm saying gaze softly. But it does change this whole um, where you need to be speaking from is a quieter place, a more calm place rather than the high anxiety space. Because most people, when they start getting afraid, then the panic starts to set in. And if I can say, ooh, just calm down, soften your eyes. Your whole brain, I mean, because whatever the wiring behind your eyes is so close to your brain, right? So that you can ah, calm your mind, calm your body, and drop down, down, down to a more uh, grounded space inside. So that was a good question, the difference between 
eye contact and eye presence. Speaking of presence. Yeah, sounds like you got some questions, my dear, huh? Absolutely. (laughs) Explain the definition of relational presence and, and how people can apply that to public speaking. Okay, what happens in speaking anxiety is that whether it's deep, like I talked about underlying fear and how you learn to be somebody who felt like you didn't have much to say early on in life because nobody listened to you or nobody welcomed you, nobody encouraged you. So you got kind of a deeper insecurity around your sense of self esteem. So that's, that's the deepest layer. Then there's coming into social environments like school or like, um, Oh, wherever you, like I mentioned, bullying could be a a situation that caused you to have anxiety. And then there's uh, all the ways in which you tried to speak up at teachers, uh, maybe um, events, and you were not very successful, let's say. So you carry that in the past all the way to some trauma where you really were uh, not able to to speak. You just, you know, got clammed up. And I have experiences with clients who ran out of the room, who had accidents on the stage. So they never want to repeat that. They never. So it's. I would say that that's close to trauma. So all that is in the past. But guess who lived there? They did. So they're going to be carrying that when, as they go forward in life, that memory sits in their, somewhere in their brain, right? And they, they, they remember it and they don't ever want to repeat it. So either they don't put themselves in a scary situation like that again, or they, um, they, they, don't even go to the event themselves. So that's in the past. So what they do is project themselves into the future. Hey, Curtis, will you show up (laughs) and give us, you know, some time or give us some advice, give us some, uh, you know, give us you and tell us, you know, some special, some, some tips that we can use to feel more confident. And you go, "Uh uh-uh, not going to do it. You know, the past starts to intrude as you project yourself into a future. So there you are caught between the past and the future, and your present isn't available to you. Do you see where I'm going, maybe, with this idea about presence? Absolutely. Good. Yeah. So the work is to whatever we need to do, whether it's healing the past or whether it's putting the past in its place or whether it's reconfiguring, telling a new story like I did with uh, a fellow who raised his hand when he was 12 years old in one of those sex, you know, the, the sex education classes. And he asked about masturbation or something like that. And the whole class laughed at him. And he remembers that as being a moment where he just wanted to put a, you know, something over his head, hide and, and just never come out again. And what we worked on was the fact that he was the most courageous person in that class. Everybody, every kid at 12 years old is wondering about you know, these questions about sex. And he was the one who was most courageous. So that reframing, you might say, was able to help him, you know, have a past that didn't intrude on his present or his future, because in the present, he he's, re- he's saying to himself, I am courageous. I'm the courageous one. So in this new present moment, that's what we're working on is cleaning up any kind of past that intrudes. And we're cleaning up any kind of anxiety that he's taking into the future. And I call that anticipatory anxiety. 
we are helping him to come into this very present, this very now moment with, and then presence, of course, is right here, right now. But relational is your listener, the person you're, or the audience you're speaking with. And that means if you can be more fully available, that means listening, means being with, it means speaking in this very now new moment with the person that you are happen to be or the audience that you are invited to speak with, then that's this idea of staying in the now, leaving the past behind, and we have techniques to do that, and leaving the future moment behind, and we have techniques to do that too. What does essential speaking mean? I then my approach is not about coming up with a better speech. It's about finding the essence of who you are. And that's what all my secrets or all my steps are about uh, finding who you truly are inside. And that's what finding your authentic voice is about. It's about taking this inner journey, you know, coming up against Ooh, you know, I'm so scared. Well, let's look at this fear. Let's see, let's see where the fear came from in the first place. And let's look at what's the worst things that could happen if you do go out into the world and speak up more so that the um, essence of who you are, that's one of the steps is finding out, well, what are your best qualities? What are your where are your strengths inside of yourself? And those strengths are really those core qualities of you. I know I'm, <laughs> I know I'm warm. I know I speak from my heart. And I've had to learn that as an introvert, I have true gifts. So that's what we have to do. Well, for those of of you out there who are wanting to do this inner work or this inner discovery or this inner what exploration and then the the what we do is find the best parts of yourself so that you can finally go yes that's who i am that's my essence that and i can speak from my essence. I don't have to go out and impress. I don't have to try and entertain. I don't have to, oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't have to be anybody else than who I am. But we usually have to get some witnessing or some environments where that feels like the yes begins to build. Do you understand what I mean about that kind of sense of finding your voice in uh, places that are where you feel like you're truly celebrated, you're Most truly definitely. heard. Yeah, you're truly heard and seen. And that's what I do. I have some online programs where I welcome people to come in. And then the the participants are listening to these, not to the content as such, but listening to a more of this essence. I just keep saying essential self, the essence of who we are. And it's different for everybody, right? Who you are at your core is different than who I am at my core. And I love finding out, well, it's a diamond or a jewel, you might say, inside of you that's already shining, that's already beaming. And let's go in and find those jewels inside of you so that you go, yes. That's who I am. Hello, world. <laughs> so talk about your seven secrets to fearless speaking. I know you kind of touched on them, but, but go over those steps. Okay. I'm excited about doing that, Curtis. One is ah, be still. And we're saying, what? We're talking about speaking and you're suggesting that People learn to be silent, to be, yes, I am. I'm saying you need to find some kind of practice 
either a relaxation practice, a breathing practice, a meditation practice, a be out in nature practice. You, you see what I'm saying is that it, yes, I'm talking about a different kind of practice. I'm not talking about practicing your speech. Yes, that's a whole different step. But where you come from has to be more secure. And this inner security, I feel, comes from being able to turn that dial down, 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 so that you're able to Oh, move like an elevator, move down, down, down to an inner strength, to a quiet that's kind of foundation, foundational. And I imagine maybe Curtis, because of uh, the work that you do, there's music and there's not just blasting, 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 but there's kind of a, maybe a lyrical quality or maybe there's a staccato quality. But inside of people, I feel like if we could, if we could be comfortable in stillness so that when people lose their way, they can go, Oh, (laughs) I just forgot where I was. Where was I? Oh, yeah. You know, it's easier to get back on track. So that's the first secret is be still. And the second secret is be present. And you're right. I just talked a little bit about the past intruding on the present in such a way that you lose yourself. You lose and you're looking at the future and you anticipate something really hard so that that you're you're rehearsing a future that doesn't feel good. So why even go there? Why even sign up to give your presentation And then the third is, and I talked about the eyes, softening the eyes and having eye presence. And that's mostly about, you know, finding the way in which you can be comfortable looking eye to eye at people. And then the fourth is listening. Ah, you know, how do, how do I help people? when they are trying to pressure themselves to speak, to actually change it into what I'm asking you to do in front of people is to listen. And that does take a certain kind of learning how to listen to those listening to you so that, oh, here it comes, so that you speak into the listening. And it's the idea is that the audience has maybe an empty glass and your words are like the wine that you're going to pour into the glass, but you don't pour it until you actually see, until you actually are listening, paying attention to people with uh, their open glass. And do they, is, are they available or are they not? available. So why would you speak into them, speak at them until you can really feel like, and this is what we're talking about in terms of relational presence. I'm here. I've already talked about stillness, presence. I have my eyes softly available and I'm listening to you listen to me. And the fifth step that I talk about or the fifth secret is this whole essence quality that is truly your, truly your nature, truly your qualities, truly your gifts. And that's what positivity is about, looking at the most positive quality inside of you, looking at the most positive quality instead of those qualities around judging, you know, people who are judging you. It's more about, ah, Oh, there's a really good quality in term in that person that's listening to to me. And then the fifth is to connect, connect to that quality inside of yourself, connect to that quality inside of the other person. And you've developed a whole new way to be with, 
to let go of the fear and to finally have the freedom to be yourself, which is the seventh secret that I talk about in my seven secrets to essential speaking. And it's speaking from the essence of you, who you are. And each one starts with B. And you notice that I've said nothing about speaking in those seven secrets. They're all about being, being here now, being present, being connected, being with yourself and being with your listeners, whether it's one person or an entire audience. <laughs> Talk, Talk about, about your things. book and your podcast, you know, tell listeners, uh, what they can expect when they read your book and listen to your show and where we can get them at. Yes. Well, my book is The Seven Secrets to Essential Speaking. And that's what I've talked about is learning how to be not so much about the content and what you say, but more about how you, who you are, who you are in the moment you know, living your life, (laughs) being happy to be in the moment with your listener. So the book is the seven, you know, what I'm talking about, the seven secrets to essential speaking, find your voice, change your life. And it's on Amazon and it's on all the channels that people can find. And you also mentioned that to talk about my podcast, which is Find Your Voice, Change Your Life. And I have a whole website, Find Your Voice, Change Your Life, uh, which is about the podcast. So find your voice, change your life.com. <laughs> and I, well, I don't know how many you've interviewed, and I welcome you to be on my podcast, Curtis. And I'm close to having 100 episodes. And that is where people come and share their journey, their struggle, their, oh, how difficult it was. Because you know me, I love to find those early moments where people had their challenges. And I love to share them. I've had people like, um, let's see, Les Brown, if you know him, and he talks about being a twin. And he was the twin that where people just didn't pay attention He was the DT he talks about, and he calls that, his teacher called him the dumb twin. Isn't that sad? So he kind of just fit into that dumb twin role until finally another, you know, teacher who gave him room to be more truly uh, the gifted person he is and who he is nowadays. Les Brown, motivational speaker. Yes. (laughs) So uh, the podcast, I on the podcast, uh, I invite people who are willing to be more real about their story rather than about, ooh, you know, about their magnificence. They've got to be able to tell the struggle that they've had. And that's, that's what I ask them to do. Well, I would definitely love to be on your show and and talk about my struggles and, you know, I'll get you my bio and and, and you'll be able to learn all about my struggles. Yeah, on the website at the bottom of the page, it says be a guest on our show and then just click on that. And that gives you all the information and the, the first step to be on the show. Absolutely. Do you have any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about? Ooh. Yes, finally, <laughs> an audio book, and it should be out maybe within this uh, next month, February 2023. It's being produced right now, hopefully as we speak. <laughs> so yes, that, and I have, I don't know, is this recording going to be out pretty soon, or how does yes, it? Yes, it is. It's going to be out pretty soon. Uh, February 23rd, I am going to be collaborating with this a wonderful woman who's a healer, a shaman, actually, a shaman who uh, works also on 
uh, a different approach, you might say, rather than the traditional approach to helping people be better speakers. And on February 23rd at, uh, well, Pacific time for me is uh, at 12. And so at wherever people happen to be, whether it's two o'clock, what is that? That's well, I don't know the, all the time zones, but I know that uh, I would love to invite people to, uh, you know, they'll find it under, well, I'll be advertising that if you go to my website, essentialspeaking.com. That's one where, one place where people are going to find out more about the programs and the coaching programs that I do to help them ooh, uncover the truth of who they truly are and being able to stand up and speak without fear. But you got to go towards fear. <laughs> All right. Essentialspeaking.com. Find your voice, change your life.com. Close us out with some final thoughts. Maybe something that I forgot to touch on that you would like to touch on or just any final thought you have for the listeners. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that all of us, whether I'm not talking about helping people uh, get up and be a motivational speaker, I'm helping people become comfortable being more of who they are meant to be. What is the light that's within them? And that's what I love to look inside and find that light <laughs> And to find that beauty and to find that brilliance that's within each one of, of us, you know, the listeners today and the people who will listen to your podcast and who will go, yes, there's more for me. And there are people out there who are willing to help me find my voice so that I can change my life. Thank you for giving me this opportunity today to share. Absolutely. And I thank you for coming on and sharing your expertise. Ladies and gentlemen, check out Dr. Downing, her book, her podcast, everything that she's up to. If you know somebody having a problem with speaking up in public, as she said, it's not just a stage. It can be anything. Share this episode to them. Make sure you give us a review and follow you have any feedback or any guests uh, suggestions, any topic suggestions, see Jackson102 at Cox.net is where you can give them to me. Doreen Downing, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, you're so welcome. It was wonderful to be chatting with you. And I just feel like uh, you've given me a really, uh, speaking of stages, and this is a stage, isn't it? This is a moment to, of life to step up and speak out. Thank you. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.